Coming up on No Pulp, the college playoff hunt is heating up. A lot of teams eyeing just a couple spots. And from an individualistic perspective, I haven't won a juicer in three years. It's me and Braden Reed discussing the best and the worst from week 11. And it's hoop season and it's only November and some big programs already with some bad upsets. No Pulp starts right now. Folks, Sonny DeShera from Auburn. The, the freshman ever won. The freshman ever won championships. Sharon, man, you are an absolute sweat. Cleveland, the catch. Good if it goes. Oh, he hit it. He hit it. Wow, he's getting serious. Frankly, I'm pretty embarrassed. Bang! Oh, my God. Thanks so much for joining us on No Pulp. That's Cameron Zaire. I'm Nick Zelaya. Cam, it's the best time of the year. The snow has fallen, which means football weather late November, and that means basketball season's here. Okay, I'm going to disagree with you that the weather is what takes into account the best part of the year. No, it's the crossover season. You got football, you got basketball, yes, but the last thing I want to hear from you is that the weather with the snow on the ground is a good thing. It's fun. No, I, it's I had fun last night no, in the, the first snow take out my here coats. in Syracuse. We'll start, though, with some football in a spot that it doesn't really snow too much. That's the SEC, where things are heating up as the college football playoffs inch just a bit closer a few weeks away until we have our four teams and the SEC and it's been good all season Georgia's been dominant Tennessee with a big win but how about LSU to start off the year with a loss a one-point loss to Florida State and now be the number seven team in the nation. Didn't look great this weekend against Arkansas, but they got the win nonetheless. Hey, they come out of the depths for an LSU team. You're right, didn't look great against Arkansas, but the defense showed up, and it's been the offense that has been the mainstay over the last three important games, in my opinion. At Florida, against Ole Miss at home, and against Bama, those last two against ranked opponents. Jaden Daniels, the starting quarterback, 72% completion percentage, over 770 yards through the air, and seven touchdowns touchdowns, no picks. The defense, like I mentioned, has also been great. 16 of 46, that's the third down conversion rate for opposing teams. Alabama, Ole Miss, Arkansas, you name it. The defense has done a great job stopping opposing teams on third downs, and Jaden Daniels has been his best in the best moments. He wasn't his best this past weekend, only 86 passing yards, but they did it on the ground, which shows mm -hmm. how versatile this Tigers team can be. Almost 200 rushing yards for LSU in that 13-10 victory. But I also want to talk a bit about Alabama and Ole Miss because they faced off. Bama obviously pulled off the 30-24 victory on a late fourth and 16 stop. And Ole Miss at the 20 yard line. They were able to get a big stop there. Alabama, they've been getting a lot of criticism lately okay, because you they're eight you and two. Don't think it's warranted? I, I don't. You know, they're eight and two right now. People are saying, oh, the dynasty is over. Nick Saban's going to retire. He's sick and tired of the NIL stuff. All of that. Two plays. Two plays in this team's 10-0. Do you right. agree with that? Yeah, I mean, a, a missed field goal and then a, a, the two-point the two conversion. They don't convert it. LSU doesn't convert it. It's a different season for Alabama. So they I, could I agree. probably be the number one team in the nation and yeah. it'd be going up against Georgia, but... Guess not. <laughs> hey, that's you're giving a lack of criticism to Alabama. Where I've been giving criticism all year, the Pac-12. Uh, not you. Wow. you. You love your Pac-12 teams. And lie. Oregon took on Washington this past weekend. And talk about an Oregon team that had the best chance out of the Pac-12 teams to make the college football playoff. They lay an egg, lose to Washington, 37 to 34. Does this say more about Oregon or Washington? And do you think Oregon still has a path? to the college football playoff, or is there another Pac-12 team that even has a chance? It's it's tough to see Oregon in, in the college playoffs at this point with that second loss. It's, it's tough to say. Oregon and Washington, it's hard to really blame a certain aspect from that game. I think the Ducks played really well overall, but Washington was just much better. And it came down to who was going to make that last defensive stop. Washington did that. They forced Oregon to go three out. They go down the field. They kick the game-winning field goal. But for this Oregon team, I think the playoff implications now, it relies a lot about this Utah game coming up. You know, if you had beat Washington, you look really good going to play the Utes this upcoming weekend. But now you have to worry about USC possibly winning the Pac-12. UCLA, who's dipped off a bit, but they still have a chance. And this, this weekend's going to be fun. We've got Oregon 
in Utah. We've got USC, UCLA. So I, I think overall it was a good game by Oregon, but just Michael Penix. I mean, he's been spectacular all season. Uh, okay, but what I will say about uh, about what Michael Penix was able to do is it doesn't mitigate the fact that Oregon had nearly 600 yards total. They've done that uh, seven games this season, 500 or more total yards, seven games this season. But this game, they have to rely more on their defense because Washington, through Penix, has such a prolific offense. 313 yards on the ground for Oregon, and they can't get it done. This is all on Dan Lanning and his ability or his decision to go for it on fourth down in your own territory with a minute left. That's ridiculous. Why would you ever do that? Rely on your defense, rely on your offense, rather than saying, okay, defense, go out there and try to stop Washington on three and out. It's ridiculous he went for it, and that cost Oregon a spot in the college football playoff. This makes me so sad, too, because Oregon, after getting spanked, against Georgia in week one, 49-3. They won eight straight. Yeah. I was thinking, oh, the Oregon, they got a chance to come to the playoffs. They got a good chance. But guess not. A team that has looked pretty good this season and hasn't lost yet, that's the TCU Horn Frogs. They yeah. won again this past weekend, a nail biter against Texas, 17-10. to They actually came into this game as underdogs, which surprised me a little bit. How legit is this Horn Frogs team now at 10-0 and on the year? Just a couple of games left in that Big 12 championship. So it's less about them being legit, only 17 points against Texas, and more about the landscape in terms of making it to the college football playoff. If you're an undefeated Big 12 team that wins your conference championship, it's hard to keep you out of the college football playoff because Clemson, they've done their due diligence losing to Notre Dame, so they won't have an undefeated team. They could still win the ACC title, but they're pretty much out of the picture. Oregon losing did numbers on TCU making the college football playoff, but I look at TCU and say, okay, are they too one-dimensional for the college football playoff? If they finish number four, will they have to play Georgia? And I understand TCU scores about 40 points a game. Oh, you got, it's ridiculous. You got Max Dugan, who's having himself one heck of a, a season. Uh, 25 touchdowns, two interceptions. Kendra Miller on the ground. Five straight 100 plus yard games, seven total. But I look at TCU and say, I just don't think they have a chance against the best of the best in the SEC. And I think the committee bogs them down for it. Yeah, this was the type of game that showed TCU for me is legit okay. when it comes to the college football players. Even if they're a four seed, because they've been in shootout, shootout, shootout. I mean, some of these scores, they beat Kansas State 38-28, Oklahoma State 43-40, Kansas 38-31. But they, they don't win by more than 10. That, that, that's all right. They, they win, though. But they, they can outscore teams. That's the Will thing. Will they do it and against that, Georgia? Well, the defense proved this past weekend against a really good Texas team, Quinn Ewers and Bijan Robinson, that they can stop them. And Bijan Robinson had the worst game possibly of his career, only 29 rushing yards. Okay. I, I just, uh, I think. The committee sending another SEC team to the, to the college football playoff, I think. <laughs> okay. Well, we do, we do end this block, though, on a sadder note. Some devastating news coming out from UVA 3 players on the football team were shot and killed last night, which was just devastating news for me to wake up. Lavelle Davis, Devin Chandler, Deshaun Perry, so sad. Yeah, thoughts and prayers go out to their families. I was fortunate enough to go to the Syracuse, Virginia game and to watch these stellar student athletes play, and it, it just shows how uh, how short life is and how precious it is. So thoughts and prayers go out to uh, to, to their families as well as the community uh, um, of Virginia and that football team because um, it'll be a long road back, but um, but yeah, thoughts and prayers go out to their families. And it's heartbreaking. And UVA basketball did cancel their game against Northern Iowa. We'll take a quick break on No Pulp and be back in 90 seconds. Blow off from school. I think it's an air raid. A lot of houses in our neighborhood have been destroyed. I like to close my ears and sing songs whenever the bombs come close. I'm worried our new neighbors won't like us. But I know it's all going to be worth it. I just want my family to be safe. But these are not my these words. These are not my words. These are not my words. They said I have troll teeth. That my voice sounded like a possessed baby doll. That no one would ever love someone as stupid as me. That I was fat. Ugly. Disgusting. The effect of bullying is potent. We will no longer be the silent majority. Now, when you see online bullying, there's something you can do about it. We're gonna take action with the eye. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness, I am a witness and so are you.
Oh boy, this one's going to be fun. It's the juicer, the best part of No Pulp Camry Zam. We're joined by Braden Reed. Guys, are we ready? Ready to go. Whatever happens, I got the Phillies over the uh, Padres in the NLCS. Oh, I'll be able to sleep oh, at night no matter we what. We did oh, not whoa. need that at all. That, hey, that was a... I not I need to beat you now. Talk about over 100 wins in the regular season, right? Who okay. Cares? Shout Met out the Mets. Yeah, right. Mm. Shout out the Mets. Well, well, let's get some college football uh, talk. None of our teams are in it for baseball. <laughs> Actually, no teams are in it anymore for baseball. Uh, best performance in Week 11. There were some really good players. This past weekend, Cam, I want to start with you. Who had the best performance this weekend? It's probably the Heisman front runner and my candidate for it. Bryce Young in a do-or-die college football play-in game. If Alabama doesn't beat Ole Miss, I don't think they're making the college football playoff as a three-loss team. And Bryce Young, he had himself quite the phenomenal game. Found five different receivers three or more times. Marched down the field, down seven to a ranked Ole Miss team again. That was at Ole Miss. And it's fresh off his worst completion percentage game of the year. He had a pick in that game, but 21 of 33, 209 yards, three touchdowns in a do or die situation for the playoff. Give me Bryce Young. Oh, Bryce Young, fantastic. Might be the number one pick in this year's draft. Maybe the Heisman. I'm going Michael Penix, though, out of Washington mm. versus Oregon. You guys just talked about how fantastic that Huskies team was this past week. It was a really important game for them, and Penix stepped up. They dropped two tough games to UCLA and ASU earlier on this year, where they got back on track, won three straight coming into this one, including a ranked win over Oregon State. On the road versus Oregon, and Penix shined 408 yards, two touchdowns. He's really silenced doubters all year, coming back, playing in Indiana for four years, coming over to this Washington team. He got benched last year with the Hoosiers. Expectations very low. He has fulfilled them all year long in this game against Oregon on the road against the number six team in the country. Expectations through the roof, and he met them. Yeah, that pick doesn't look good, though. So just I, I'm going to have to go with the former Hoosier and now oh, the Washington okay. Husky, okay. Michael Pennant. He's a I mean, hooker. He's, fan, had, it looks he's like. had a great season, QBR wise, best game of the year. And he upset the Oregon Ducks. But now we're going to start with the worst performance of the week. And if you're on this list, oh, I'm sorry. You don't want to be on this list. Braden, I'm going to start with you on this one. The worst performance from week 11 of the college football season. Yeah, Hopefully I'm going to go Braden. with... Hopefully Braden has the worst performance. Appreciate that. I want to go Kentucky's <laughs> Will Levis against Vanderbilt. This was an absolute dud. I think that's the nicest way to say it. Total opposite reasoning behind what, what Michael Penix just did uh, for Washington. Expectations this season sky high for Levis in particular. Might be a first-round top 10 pick in this year's NFL draft. And Kentucky, too, has gotten all the way up to 7 in this year's college playoff rankings. Absolute duck against Vanderbilt, though. 109 yards, no touchdowns, and interceptions. Sub-50% sub completion percentage. Men lie, women lie. Numbers don't, but numbers were terrible. <laughs> Kentucky loses to a Vanderbilt team. Hasn't won an SEC game since 2019. Kentucky got caught with their pants down. Looking ahead to Georgia next mm. week. I get it. It's a big game. You can't forget about the Commodores, though. Will Levis, terrible in this game. He's the reason they lost. That QBR also looked really bad. 15.5? Yeah, that's not that's, great. An, that's not an great. F minus, not minus, great. minus <laughs> on, on an essay. I'm going with two players. Quinn Ewers and Bijan Robinson, probably the most electric duo coming into the season in terms of expectations. Quinn Ewers, one of the most hyped quarterbacks. I mean, he wasn't just a five star, he was in a hundred rating. Bijan Robinson, 10th in the nation in rush yards, over 1,100, 12 touchdowns. But Bijan Robinson lays an egg. 12 carries, only 29 yards, worst game of his career by far. Fewest amount of rushing yards. Not just that, Quinn Ewers, what was that? You're talking about a Texas team at one point was ranked and was relying so heavily on that backfield in Robinson and Ewers. And Quinn Ewers, an interception, no touchdowns, a bad completion percentage. Give me a duo over just a singular player. Well, I'd love to talk about Will Levis because he's a Connecticut guy. Okay, Why not? Yeah. He, he did go. But the Longhorns were pretty bad. I'm not going to lie there. <laughs> I'll points. give Cam the point on this one. It's now 1-1, and we move to our next topic. And Cam, I want to start with you. Week 11 of the season's all wrapped up a lot of teams. They hit that six-win margin to become bowl eligible. But which one is the most surprising so far? Well, it's a Carolina team, not a Connecticut team. Um, and it's all right. It's East, all right. East Carolina, Mike Houston took over this program fresh off of, uh, of uh, national championship appearances at James Madison. And he looked like he would take that Dukes team to a new level in the FCS, but he comes over to East Carolina. This team is 6-4, and four, only a one-point loss to ranked NC State, 7-5 and five last year. You might say, well, then the expectations is they should go to a bowl game, but they weren't bowl eligible since 2014 when they entered the 2021 season. Houston's done a great job since he joined the program. Two losing seasons his first two years, but has completely changed around that American Athletic Conference team in the East Carolina Pirates. Yeah, look, he's got them playing well, but I gotta go Rock Chalk Jayhawk. 
baby. Kansas, mm -hmm. what a surprise they've been. A surprise in every sense of the word so far this season. Coming into the year, dead last in the Big 12 preseason poll, and it wasn't particularly close by a large margin. After a 2-10 and season, rightfully so, the laughing stock of college football. It was a meme when they beat Texas last year. How funny that was, if you remember back there. No one expected them to rip off five straight wins to start this season. Got to 19 in the polls. First loss came against now number four TCU, only by seven. It's been a bit of a free fall from there. I get it. One and four since that impressive start. Not going to be a New Year's six, New Year's New Year's six bowl team, but this is still really impressive what Lance Leipold has done in his second season in Kansas. He's got this program on the up and up. I don't think anyone expected them to be bowl eligible coming into this year. Yeah, I'm going to go with Braden on this one. Kansas has They've been so many trash games. forever. And they but been trash they got six. They were they ranked earlier this season, and now they're playing at a bowl game so shout out to the Jayhawks. Ridiculous. Braden two, Cam one. We've got okay. one more question. Time. This one's for double the points still. We've got two and Braden I want to start with you. We just talked about some teams that are bowl eligible. How about a team that shocks you that they haven't got six wins yet this year? I'm going to go over to the Big Ten and Michigan State. Uh, really disappointing for them. And they set themselves up to have success with that 2021 season they had. Made a playoff push towards the end of the year, 11-2. and two, beat, beat, beat Pitt in the Peach Bowl. A lot of excitement for them. And Mel Tucker signed a 10-year, $95 million contract in the offseason. Right now, looking like it might be up there with Jimbo Fisher for the worst coaching contract in the sport. 5-5, five and five, been blown out by Minnesota, Ohio State, Michigan. Beat Rutgers by one score. Just really not impressive to them. Kenneth Walker's off to the NFL and he's in Frank's fantasy team. Not doing anything for Michigan State anymore. <laughs> this is not the same Spartans team that we expected to see coming into the season. Extremely disappointing. It's shocking they're not bowl eligible yet. Last chance might be Indiana this weekend. They got Penn State to close out the year. Clock's ticking. Well, real me this. I saw Ethan Frank hooting and hollering about Oklahoma not being bowl eligible. <laughs> five and five, and they have a tough road for the last two games. I don't think Oklahoma's going to make a bowl game. That's shocking under Brent ben Benables, the former defensive coordinator at Clemson. Started 3-0, and but they've allowed 30 points per game. That's led the to their demise, and I understand. Oklahoma plays in a conference that is on the up and up with a few teams that are ranked. Kansas State is one of those surprises, but come on. Dylan Gabriel, a 4-1 to touchdown to interception ratio. Eric Gray over 900 yards, but the defense just stinks. So no way in heck Oklahoma shouldn't be bowl eligible with those statistics, but right now they're not. Love this. We got a Big Ten team and we got a Big 12 team right here. Michigan State, they have really disappointed me this year, but Oklahoma's been even worse. We're going with Cam on this one to win the juicer. Oklahoma to pull out the 3 2 Mom, victory. Mom, I did it. I did it. I finally I'm won sorry, a juicer. Brandon. I'm sorry, Brandon. My losing streak continues. Now I'm taking your shoes. Still no wins in this. 0 4 now. We'll take a quick break on No Pulp. When we come back, we'll talk a little college hoops. Some big programs. Uh oh, they're in trouble, and it's only the second week of November. We'll be back in just a little bit. Hey, Hard, what's this? That's my resignation letter. You're resigning? Why? Because you're constantly ignoring me. You're half as active as you used to be, and you get stuff like this. You've been putting me under a lot of pressure lately. That's why I'm ready to quit. I, I forgot. I'll, I'll do better. Please, don't quit on me. OK, but remember, it's not what you say. It's what you do. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Let's go for a walk. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. They told me a bottle couldn't dream. That I would never become a superhero. But I learned how to fly. Just to come back in a new disguise and be the hero that I've always wanted to be.
It's college hoop season, not just on the hardwood, but in our Citrus TV studio. That's Nick Zelaya. I'm Cameron Ezer. Back on No Pulp, buyer's remorse in college hoops. I can pretty much call this one the John Rothstein segment <laughs> because I had to go back on his Twitter and look through all those epitome of brutality tweets about teams that paid lower level teams to come and visit and beat them <laughs> easy, get early Ws, but were unable to do it. Buyer's remorse, Nick. Some really good teams in college basketball, some really bad losses. Who you got? Well, we're going to start in the ACC, and we're going to go with the Louisville Cardinals. It's not bad. just one bad loss, two. Bellarmine to start. We're not going to talk about Bellarmine, though. Wright State I have a big issue with. When you're up five points with a minute and 15 seconds left, you should not lose to Wright State. But Louisville did exactly that on that buzzer beater shot from Wright State. L. Ellis is the senior guard leader on this team. He had 29 points in this one. But the big issue was eight turnovers, and that's been a big issue for this Louisville Cardinals team all season. 19 turnovers, resulting in 42 points for Wright State in this one. You're not going to win many games playing like that. I understand it's Kenny Payne's first season as head coach for Louisville, and this Cardinals team, scandal-wise, all, all that stuff, they're a complete mess. But if the Cardinals want to have some sort of momentum going to ACC play, they got to pick it up. Well, now the money is on our wall rather than in the, I'll in, take it rather than the right pockets state. of Louisville. <laughs> yeah, two bad losses there. Another thing that's been dealing with a lot of ups and downs, Oklahoma State ineligible for the tournament last year, and you lose to Southern Illinois. Are you Ew. kidding me? A Southern Illinois team that just lost to Southern Indiana, a lot of Southerns going on, by 18 after they beat Oklahoma State. You said you want to focus for Louisville on on the, the, the final couple minutes and how you should be up. Same with Oklahoma State. This is a team in the final four minutes, 0 for 6 from the field, 1 for 4 from the free throw line, one point in the final four minutes at home against Southern Illinois. That is absolutely ridiculous for a Southern Illinois team that has been so abysmally bad on the road over the past couple years. I want to read it to everyone. 10 and 26 in the last three Ooh. seasons on the road, but you beat Oklahoma State, and Oklahoma State has a seven foot starter. You got out rebounded too. Ridiculous. That's a whole lot of buyer's remorse. Yeah, luckily they bounced back and beat Oakland in their next game. But Who still, they lost to long, last year. Long, They're used to buyer's remorse. Long term, it's not good to have that type of look on your resume. Let's get to the Villanova Wildcats because Jay Wright obviously leaves the program and they lost already in a game. And this is a tough Big East conference this year. You got teams like UConn, Creighton, Seton Hall. But when you have veterans on this team, like Caleb Daniels, like Eric Dixon, like Brandon Slater, I understand Cam Whitmore hasn't played yet. And he's one of the top freshman prospects coming into the season. He's projected top 10 NBA pick. But still, you got to win these games against Temple. I mean, Villanova, they haven't looked good. Last year, they averaged 25 three-point shots a game. They took seven against Temple. And That's you know bad. who led the Owls in scoring? Khalif Battle, younger brother of Tyus, wow. who went here to Syracuse. And I was going to say who because of the joke with the Temple Owls, but, yeah. but, I, but I didn't do it. Nice. USC, let's head out west, plays Florida Gulf Coast. And I'm going to track it back to what I just said about Oklahoma State losing. Yes, they went on to beat Oakland while Southern Illinois had themselves a doozy against Southern Indiana. Florida Gulf Coast, after beating USC in a shocker, just lost to the University of San Diego. That's not San Diego State. That's the University of San Diego for a USC team that is pretty much 6'6 six, six and above. They love above the rim. USC predicted fourth in the Pac-12. One player at over seven points for USC. Only one player, and guess what? Florida Gulf Coast, they're not Dunk City anymore, and USC just lost their share of what could be a fight with UCLA all the way to the end in the Pac-12. That was a really, really bad loss for the Trojans, and, and you're Tro you like the Trojans. I, so. I do, yeah. Well, yeah. When you shoot three for 19 from deep, it's not going to win you many games, but I do want to give a shout-out to Drew Peterson. You know Drew Peterson. Fifth year, he had seven points. 20, do anything. 21 points a couple of games ago. Oh, He's couple averaging games ago. 14 Seven and a half and six. Triple double Ridiculous. watch for Mr. Peterson. The, the three threes for USC, all to Boogie Ellis, only three points. That's awful. We're going to take a quick break, break here on No Pope. When we come back, plays of the week and our game of the week. A little bit of a surprise. We're heading to a place that knows a lot about sun. We'll be back in a bit. Taking care of a family member can lead to plenty of questions. Fortunately, there's a place to get the answers for them and for you. 
Find articles, tips, and tools from experts and others who have been in your place. The Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org slash caregiving. Look at you. You're at the top of your game. You're unstoppable. Nothing can throw you off track. Wait, is that your car? Uh-oh. Yeah, I saw that coming. That will throw you off track. You're looking at around 10 grand in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Let's try this again. Smart move. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Wrapping up things on No Pulp, Cameron is there. I'm Nick Salaya, and we get going with our plays of the week. This guy's dad played for Syracuse. He had a long career at the Indianapolis mm -hmm. Colts. He was pretty good in the NFL, but now his son doing some big things. Yeah, Let's ju go. Junior doing senior things. <laughs> One of the best catches I've ever seen out of Marvin Harrison Jr. And I could tell you in detail exactly what happened, but I think my leg would be broken. Oh Marvin Lord. Harrison Jr., that's not a catch, right? There, there's no way that's a catch. Oh, uh, that's a catch. Somehow, watch that right foot. I, I don't know how you do that. The foot and then the leg bends. How does your rear end get lower than your knee on a catch when you're that far out of bounds? Unbelievable out of Marvin Harris Jr. What a catch from the wide receiver. I mean, he's one of the best receivers in the country. Uh, I, again, my leg feels broken under the <laughs> desk. We get to Mount Union. Let's go some Division Three football here. A uh, Hail Mary play. Now listen to this here. Mount Union, this was for their 31st undefeated season in program history. Braxton plunked to Wayne Ruby Jr., who catches it 23 to 21 the final. I mean, tips off the cornerback's defender into the hands of Ruby Jr. And they're undefeated. How do you even do that? I, I don't know. Ridiculous. Pretty good. Let's get to our favorite part of the show, our game of the week. It's time for the No Pulp Game of the Week. Number 8 USC and number 12 UCLA. Who you got winning this one? I got USC winning this one. They're away from home, which might be a disadvantage, but it's a UCLA team that hasn't looked good over the past three, four, five games on the defensive side, while USC in the last five games has scored over 40 points in each one of them. I'll have to go with the Trojans, too. They, they pick up the victory. They Makes pick up easy. the victory. <laughs> so let's finish up with our final words now. And I've got to talk some UConn football because they got six wins. They are bowl eligible for the first time since 2015. And it's been ugly. 3-9, 3-9, 1-11, 2-10, 1-11 since 2015. I mean, it's been hideous to watch UConn Huskies football. But hey. They are going to play in a bowl game. And props to Jim Mora, who's been out of football for four years. He comes back, leads this team to an upset victory over Liberty. An 8-1 and one Liberty team. The fans stormed the field. I mean, it was just such an exciting scene in Connecticut. And the Huskies... Say hello to a bowl game. I miss the madness of March, which is why Shaheen Holloway scheduling St. Peter's after he went to his alma mater at Seton Hall, thrashing St. Peter's, I might add. But Shaheen Holloway playing his old team that he took all the way to the Elite Eight in March Madness. That was the best medicine that I needed to remind me, hey, the madness, it's coming back in March. God, that was so fun in March Madness. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. And now that he's doing it at Seton Hall where he played? Uh, the alma mater, and I will say Seton Hall, blew out St. Peter's. Casey and Defo went from Seton or went from St. Peter's to Seton Hall. It's just cool to see that crossover between two schools you don't really see it. They're going to be good in the Big oh, East yeah. this year too. That'll wrap up this episode of No Pulp. Thanks so much for joining us and shout out to our producer Ben Spector. That's Cameron Dezaire. I'm Nick Zelaya. Make sure you stay tuned for next week's episode for more college football and college basketball action.